from the very beginning, we have wandered. We have searched the world for meaning and a higher purpose. He is the answer. He is the way. He is the truth. And He is the life. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name. Oh, good morning, good morning, church, and uh, welcome to our, the beginning of our Easter series. I'm so excited. I love Easter. I love spring. I love everything that goes along with Easter at this time of the year. So I'm really excited about this series. I'm so excited about what God's doing in and through His church. I'm so glad that you're here today. And, and you know, in our culture, Easter has become about a lot of other things, right? In our culture, Easter has become about bunnies, right? I don't know how, but it did. And it became about bunnies and Easter bunny. And that's a lot of people's Easter, right? Is that, or it's become about eggs, Right? People painting eggs and hiding eggs and Easter egg hunts. And that's kind of, everybody's kind of thinking about that for Easter. Or it's become about chocolate, right? And every, you know, chocolate company's got an Easter packaging going because it's Easter, right? So we're going to have this kind of, it's become about flowers, right? It's great. There's tulips, there's lilies, it's Easter. It's become about things like peeps. Why? I don't know. But it's become about peeps, right, that, that are out there. It's become about Cadbury cream eggs, right? Only time. It's Easter. It's Easter. So we get this, right? It's also become about family and friends and meals. And maybe in your mind, you've already been thinking about Easter and who's coming over or where we're traveling or what's going to happen and what's going on. Now, not that any of these things are bad, except for peeps, okay? okay these are kind of bad. I don't know, like, whoever created peeps, like, let's make sugar into a pile, like, looks like a chick and give it to our kids. I don't know who came up with that. But, but besides that, everything else, none of that other stuff, that's fine, that's okay. But here at Rolling Hills, we want to say, no, Easter's about Jesus, right? Easter's all about Jesus. I mean, He has come. He has conquered death. He is alive. And we want to worship and we want to celebrate the Jesus of Easter, and so this morning, as we launch this series, I pray that your heart is full and expectant and getting ready to celebrate and worship a risen Savior, Jesus, because He is alive. He is alive. You know, our last series, we talked about love everyone always, and, and we were starting to lead up to the cross and the resurrection, and we saw how Jesus' ministry and His teaching, and He started talking about love. And he's healing all these people. And, and the religious leaders of the day are like, man, what's this guy doing? You know, we thought it was just about us. And Jesus is going, no, it's about all people. And it's about love. And it, it, it goes to the Samaritan. It goes to the tax collector. It goes to the ends of the earth. It is a relationship with God through love. So we saw his ministry. And now we're looking at his mission. And Jesus is making it really clear. He says, right, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's like pointing him out to say, listen, I am the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting for. If you're taking notes, listen, Easter, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And we can try to make it other things, but don't let those things rob what God is doing in your heart and your life. Don't get distracted from Jesus because Jesus' ministry and his mission, everything is leading to his resurrection. All of history right? All of history is pointing to the resurrection. This is the defining point of history. Changes everything. Nobody had ever conquered death before. I mean, death, the big bully on the block, like it was over. You're done. You could go and see the religious tombs of religious leaders, right, all over the world. But when you go to Jesus' tomb, it's empty. <laughs> He's not there because He is alive. God is making a way for us through Jesus so this morning, we're going to look at the way. Next week, we'll talk about the truth, that Jesus is the truth. And next week, Jesus is the life. And then we're going to celebrate on Easter Sunday morning. Easter Sunday morning. So let's talk about Jesus is the way. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, all talking about Jesus' ministry, his mission, and we're going to be in John chapter 10 today. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there's some Bibles in the back. I'd love for you to grab a Bible, put your name in it. It's yours. You can keep it. 
Uh, also, I just want to encourage you, if you've never read the Bible or you're kind of new to the faith or you're just checking out Christianity, John is awesome. And, and this would be a great place for you to start. In fact, if you read a chapter a day between now and Easter Sunday, you'll end on April 21st. You'll end on Easter Sunday morning. So great place to start. Now, if you're part of Rolling Hills and you're taking a daily step, like I've been doing, like we read, we have a Bible passage on the Rolling Hills app. We just finished Acts. Somebody came up to me, they were like, man, I loved it. Never read Acts. It was awesome. I'm like, yeah, we start Romans tomorrow. Get ready. And so, you know, like we're diving into Romans. But if you've never done that, hey, check out John or jump on the app and let's go to Romans because we know we're so pumped to be here. I mean, it's awesome. But we want our faith to be a daily commitment to Christ. And so we're diving into his word each and every day. So pick up here, John chapter 10, we're verses one through 21 today. And he says this, notice these are red letters, okay? So these are the very words of Jesus. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, and the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. So Jesus is talking to them. He says, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Okay. Notice a couple of things. Notice he's talking to the religious leaders. Uh, if you remember from our last series, the Pharisees, you know, they were the ones that were all about religion and they were all about the rules and the laws. And, and the Pharisees believed in Judaism that the Old Testament, there's 613 laws in the Old Testament. And they believed that kind of built a fence around Judaism, that built a fence around the Jews. And so here they are, they've got the law. And Jesus comes along and goes, hey guys, you're missing it. I'll take your illustration, right? I'll take the fence thing. But let me just tell you, it's a, it's a sheep pen. It's not about religion, it's about a relationship. Now, in ancient Israel, they would build sheep pens with boulders, with rocks, right? They didn't, they didn't you know, have these beautiful fences and paint them black and make them look stylish. They didn't have that, right? They had a bunch of big rocks because they're like, you know, rugged terrain. So they would find a village, would find some grassy area, they would come along, all the men would get together, and they would pile up these rocks to make this little fence around to protect the sheep. So they've got this sheep pen there. Now, the people in the community, they would all bring their sheep into the sheep pen. So there's different people who have different sheep in that sheep pen. But these sheep know their master's voice, right? They know the shepherd's voice. So the shepherd would come up and he would begin to call them by name, and these sheep would come out and they would follow. The sheep were like their pets. The sheep were close to them. The sheep were valuable and important to the shepherd. Uh, how many of you are pet owners? Pet owners, right? I mean, your dog or your cat, right? They're like part of the family. You know, right? you know what I'm saying, right? They're, they're a part. I mean, you're going to take care. You love them. That's the way they were with the sheep. They were important in the family. Uh, the other day, we were walking down the street. And I saw a lady. She had a dog stroller. Like, I don't know if you guys seen it. I, I've never seen this thing. But like, she's like strolling this dog and this dog's like sitting up. He's got like a sweater on. He's like, check it out. You know, I'm <laughs> rolling down my stroller, you know. I'm like, that's a lucky dog. You know, he's probably eating filet back home. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I mean, she was taking care of that dog. I was like, wow. Okay. I mean, so, you know, you love that pet, right? You love, they are special. These shepherds, man, this was their livelihood. These, they know them. They love them. And they held on to them. And so Jesus comes along and he says, hey, guys, listen, the sheep, they know my voice. And our call is to know his voice, to know his voice. Did you see what he was saying there? He said, guys, the, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and his sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Jesus is going, religion builds this fence around, but, but I'm saying, come follow me. I'm talking about a relationship with me. Do you know that Jesus knows your name? You ever thought about that? You know, in a lot of major world religions, the supreme being's unknowable or their supreme being, you know, it doesn't care, unapproachable. But Christianity is so different because 
the God of the universe knows your name. He like knit you together in your mother's womb. He, he cares about you. He loves you. He, he dotes all over you. I mean, you are special to him. And Jesus knows your name. And Jesus leads his people. He leads his people. And, and that's important because here in the United States, you know, we think about sheep and we think about, you know, they're being herded and there's, the shepherd's usually behind, right? You got sheep dogs that are keeping them in. In the Middle East, they had such a relationship. I mean, they loved their sheep and they would call them by name and the sheep would literally follow them. So if you go to the Middle East, you'll see shepherds that are walking and the sheep are just trailing right behind them. They're just right there. That's why Jesus is with us. He leads us. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Hey, maybe I feel lost in my life. I just need to hold on to Jesus. I don't have to know the way. I don't have to, have to figure it all out. I, I, he is the way. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to hold on to him. So the question becomes, can you hear the voice of Jesus when he calls your name and speaks to you? This is a part of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity is learning to hear the voice. You know, there comes a time that God draws you to himself and invites you into a relationship with him through Jesus. It's your salvation experience, but it, it doesn't end there. It's, a, it's growing, it's learning to hear, it's being in the word and it's being in prayer. And then you, as God prompts you, you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna follow, I'm gonna trust, I'm gonna grow. That's spiritual growth. Jesus goes, it's not just about religion, it's about a relationship. Follow me, follow me. Now the Pharisees, they didn't get it. You know, it says that, right? That Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees didn't understand. They're like, wait a minute. They had so much tradition built up that they couldn't see what God was doing. Therefore, verse seven, Jesus said again. He's like, okay, I'll reiterate this. Let me make this really clear. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. And then verse 10, maybe it's a verse you've heard before, but, but see it in this context, Jesus saying it. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Have it to the full, and that's awesome. Okay, now think about this. In ancient Israel, when they built the sheep pen, right? And they took the big rocks and they built this, you know, round kind of pen. They, they didn't use, they didn't have a gate, right? You didn't build the gate with a bunch of big rocks. Because every time you would take the sheep out, you're like, hey, Bob, can you help me move the rocks, right? You're like, you know, and, and can you put them back? They're back in. I mean, it's like every day you know, they're going in and out. So you're not going to do that. You know what the gate was? The shepherd, <laughs> Literally the shepherd, like whoever was on duty and was taking the sheep out, that night they would sleep at the front. They're literally the gate. And you know why? Because the sheep have predators. I mean, there's wolves that want to eat the sheep. That's a good meal, right, for them. So, so there's predators. I Googled the other day, just for fun, uh, I was studying this, and, and I Googled how many sheep got eaten like last year, uh, just in the United States by predators. 224,000 sheep last year couple of years ago were eaten just in the United States by like wolves and predators for sheep. It's just an interesting fact. You can keep it with you, but just know this, that, that it was dangerous to be a shepherd, okay? I mean, like these guys are constantly fighting off sheep. You remember David fought off a bear and a lion to protect the sheep, you know? So, so it's not an easy job. I mean, basically you're sleeping there saying, over my dead body, you're getting these sheep, you know? I mean, that's how much you love these sheep. So Jesus is like, I am the gate. I, I am, I am the way. I mean, he's like putting in these terms like, do you get this? Do you understand this? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. And he goes, guys, you know, maybe you have this tradition. Maybe you have this thing, this religion. And, and the Old Testament is fantastic. It's great. But all of it's pointing to me, the Messiah. 300 prophecies concerning my coming and I'm here. Don't miss me because you're caught up in the fence. You're caught up in all the laws. You're caught up in all the tradition. But we can do that today, right? We can do that today. And people go, well, you know, I mean, I don't really need to go to church. I mean, I was baptized as an infant. 
I'm like, that's great. I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, that's your parents' decision, you know, but, but that's good. I'm glad you did that. That's great. But they're like, yeah, I'm good. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm good. You know, you're like, no. I mean, Jesus is calling you to follow him. It's a relationship. But we can come back to religion. We can come back to tradition. We can come back to that's the way it is. And Jesus is going, no, I'm the way. And notice this, that Jesus is not a way, but the way. <laughs> Jesus didn't give a lot of options there. You know, like, hey, I'm, you know, A, B, or C, just choose. He's like, no, I, I am the way. I am the way. He goes, hey, now there's gonna be thieves and robbers. And thieves and robbers are gonna come in. And thieves and robbers, they're gonna come back here. I know they are. Come here, right there they are. Thieves and robbers can be anything that portrays to be a way to God other than Jesus. Anything that can be a way to God other than Jesus. So false teachers, do you realize there were other people around at this time who were saying they were the Messiah? It wasn't just Jesus. There were other people who were saying, oh, I'm the Messiah. But they would come and go and they would be like gone. Thieves and robbers could be tradition. Thieves and robbers could be religion. They could be these things. And so Jesus goes, guys, let me tell you about thieves and robbers. Here's what's gonna happen. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Isn't that true? You guys know we have an enemy. <laughs> There's wolves that want to prey on us, right? The Bible even says the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And we don't think about it a lot. We kind of live our lives. We don't think that we're in a spiritual battle, but we are. Why? Because Satan hates God. But Satan can't get to God. I mean, God is all powerful. And so what does Satan do? He goes after God's children. And his, as the thief, his agenda is to steal. And doesn't he do that? He wants to steal our joy. He wants to steal our joy. Uh, this morning, I woke up, woke up early. I was so excited about church. I'm like, woo, Easter series, can't wait, pumped. I go in the pantry and I reach up to grab this box and all of a sudden this box of Cheerios just falls, boom, all over the floor. And I'm like, what, in, you know, who left the Cheerios out? You know, like, but then I had this moment of going, well, it's Sunday, of course, right? I mean, Satan's gonna come. He wants to steal my joy. He doesn't want me to get excited. Have you ever noticed like every time it's on a Sunday that things like go crazy, right? The kids are late. You're like, come on, we're going to church. Be happy. You know, get in the car. You know, get in here. Let's go. You know, like, it's a Sunday. It's like, why is that? Because we got an enemy. We got an enemy who doesn't want us to come and to experience the joy. Right? He wants to steal the joy. He wants to kill our relationships. You ever thought about that? You know, in your marriage, right? Sometimes you'll, you'll get a disagreement and then all of a sudden it escalates. It goes up like a whole different level. And you're like, Whoa, and you're starting to yell at each other. You're like, wait a minute, what, what are we fighting about? How did it go from here to here? You got an enemy. <laughs> you got somebody who wants to come in there. Have you ever noticed like your teenagers is just like goes to a different place? Like, what happened? And he wants to destroy our lives. Guys, it's a spiritual battle. Jesus was making that clear. Uh, I saw the other day that Williamson County, you know, that's what I was living here in Williamson County. Williamson County is the seventh wealthiest county in the entire United States. Okay, out of 3,145 counties in the United States, Williamson County is number seven. Now, think about that for a moment, okay? If the world would say that, hey, success is all about money or success is all about fame, success is all about, I mean, you've got it made. You live in the United States of America, but not only that, you live in the seventh wealthiest county in one of the best states in the United States. So why do we still have struggles? <laughs> why do we still have all kinds of people dealing with loneliness and fear and depression and the list goes on and on and on? Why? It's a spiritual battle. And money's not gonna solve it. It's not gonna be like, hey, if I get more money, then I'm gonna solve all my problems. Yeah, I'm telling you, Jesus comes along and goes, I'm gonna say what is really true. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, and I love this, praise God, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came that you and I might have life. Isn't that awesome? That's where life comes. Jesus wants you to experience life to the full. He wants you to experience life in this life and in the life to come. But he wants you to enjoy it. And it only comes in him. You know the word enthusiasm? In theos, in God. That's where it comes from. That's where enthusiasm comes from. It's in him. Jesus is saying that right here. And then he goes on 
And he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd. It does not own the sheep. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock and it scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and because <laughs> he cares nothing for the sheep. You know, if you were at the park today and it's a beautiful day, you're at the park and there's a lady sitting there and she's got her cat and she's like, hey, I got to run the restroom. Will you watch my cat? And so they put the cat down and then you see a coyote coming and you're like, hey, see a cat? You know, it's like, I mean, you know, you're, you're like, it's not my cat. I'm not going to fight this battle, right? But now if that's your cat, it's a whole different thing. You're like, get off me, coyote. Come on, you know, I'll take you on because that's mine, right? And you can see that's what Jesus is going. The good shepherd's going to fight. The good shepherd's not just a hired hand. The good shepherd owns the sheep. The good shepherd is going to be there and fight. I love that. Thank you, God, that you fight on my behalf. Thank you that you are there for me, that you are fighting for me. Jesus says it again right here, verse 14, right? I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Now, you've got to see this because Jesus being the good shepherd means so much. We see the depth of his love, his grace. We see that he is with us, that he will fight for us, that he will lead us. But I also want you to see what he's saying here because this is one of Jesus' seven I am statements in the gospel of John. There are seven statements here where Jesus says, I am. And when the Pharisees, the religious leaders would have heard this, boom, their, their, their antennas would have gone up, their minds would have been blown. They'd been like, blasphemy, blasphemy. Because what Jesus is saying goes back all the way to Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three, you may remember Moses, you may remember the burning bush. Remember Moses is out in the desert and he sees this bush and it's on fire. Moses is like, that's weird. It's not burning up. What's going on? So he goes over to check it out and God's in the bush. And God says to Moses, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. And Moses is like, whoa, I wasn't ready for this, but here we go. And he's standing there in front of God. And God says, Moses, I want you to go back to Pharaoh, back to Egypt and tell him to let my people go. And Moses goes, God, I don't know if you remember this. I killed a guy before I left. And you know, they want my head over there. I don't think that's a good idea. And God goes, Moses, I'm God, you're not. Okay, so I got this thing worked out. You go back. And Moses says this, he goes, well, who am I supposed to say sent me? You remember what God said? Tell him I am sent you. I am who I am, Yahweh, the personal name for God. Now Jesus comes along and he says, I am, I am. And they'd been like, whoa, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, and I didn't put them in your notes. You can write them down if you want to and go back and look at them, but he says, starts off at John 6, I am the bread of life. I am. He comes back, he goes, I am the light of the world. I am. He says here in John 10, right, I am the gate. And then he talks about, I am the good shepherd. We'll see in a couple of weeks where he'll say, I am the resurrection. <laughs> And then I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then finally he'll say, I am the vine. The vine, like all nourishment, spiritual growth, nourishment comes through Christ, through his word. I am. He's making it so clear. I'm stepping off the page and stepping into this world and stepping into your life. I am. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is making it clear that he is fully God. Emmanuel, God with us. He says, this is radical, verse 16, I have other sheep. They're not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Guys, that's good news for us. I mean, that is such good news for us because the Jews, they thought it was all about them. And Jesus is going, no, I got others, Gentiles. Even though it says in the Old Testament, I'll make you a light to the Gentiles, right? They kind of missed that. He's like, no, there's others that are gonna be a part of this. It's not about church, it's not about denominations, it's about Jesus. 
It's about Jesus. There's one flock, one shepherd, one voice. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Now think about that for a second. This is before he died. This is before the cross. Jesus is like calling his shot. He goes, guys, just know this. I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to take it up again. What do you mean? You're going to be resurrected? Yeah, like I'm coming back to life. No one takes it from me. It's not the Jews, it's not the Romans, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Jesus is making a way for all people. Jesus is making a way for all people. Please don't miss that today. That you're invited into the story. That there's a God who loves you so much that he sent his one and only son for you. That you could have a way to life. Jesus is the way to life. Jesus is the way to an abundant life with God. You know, one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible is Psalm 23. And I want you to hear Psalm 23 in light of what Jesus just said about being the good shepherd. Listen to these words. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is. Not the Lord was, not the Lord will be, the Lord is. And he is what? He is my shepherd. Think about that personal. Not your parents' faith, your church's faith, your country, where you were born, personal. The Lord is my shepherd. And then I lack nothing. You know, because of Christ, because of salvation, do you realize you lack nothing? Your eternity is secure. That God is with you. That God is for you. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Not the barren desert where there's nothing to eat, right? In green pastures where it's lush. I mean, he spoils me, right? He leads me beside quiet waters. He leads me by quiet waters, not the rushing waters where I'm scared to drink and if I stumble and fall, I'm going in and swept away. No, by quiet waters. He leads me. It, it, Jesus has a plan for you both now and for eternity. And your call is to follow. Your call is to listen. Your call is to trust. He refreshes my soul. Don't you love that? I pray every Sunday as a, as a refreshment for your soul. <laughs> And the busyness of our week and all the things that war against us, all the noise out there, and we come in and we're just like, ah, oh, I can drink deeply of the things of God. It just refreshes me. It refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path <laughs> for his name's sake, even though I walk through the darkest valley. I don't know, maybe you're in a dark valley today. Maybe you're in a challenging time today. I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I mean, you got that rod, you're going to beat off any wolf. You're, you're greater. You're stronger. You are the good shepherd. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I mean, really, when you think about all God's done for us, the grace his love, his mercy, family, friends, shelter, food, clothes. I mean, we have so much. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And look at that last word. Forever. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Forever. This life is not all that there is, guys. It's like a blip on the radar. Forever forever. You come back to John 10 after Jesus says all this. He makes this declaration of who he is. It says, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? 
Can a demon do this? No. No. Jesus' declaration demands a response. And back then, they had to respond, right? And some people were like, man, he's a, a raging lunatic. And other people were like, wow, he is Lord. C.S. Lewis is, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. What do you believe? So what do you believe about Jesus? I mean, there's really no middle ground. You know, do I believe that he is the son of God? Do I believe that he has the power to hold my heart and hold my life for eternity? Or do I believe that he was, you know, a good man, a prophet, he was out there? What do you believe about Jesus? Is he the way for you? Is he the way for you? Can you hear his voice when he speaks to you? You know, I was a youth pastor. Uh, and back then, there was a, a kid who, who came to camp one year. And I, I love camp. I love church camp. It just makes such an impact. It's such a difference. If you have a, a child in children's ministry or in student ministry, you know, make sure they go to Rolling Hills, you know, summer camp because it, it will impact their lives. And, and there was a family and they would come off and on to church. They weren't real consistent. They weren't real faithful. They weren't real kind of committed. Uh, but their son wanted to go to camp and he had a buddy. And so he went to camp and, and he goes and, and he gives his life in seventh grade. He gives his life to Christ. And he's so fired up. And I remember his small group leader, Steve, was there. And, and Steve was like, Jeff, it's awesome. You know, Billy's committed his life to Christ. And this kid, I mean, he needed Jesus, okay? He was kind of going down the wrong path and making some bad decisions. And man, his life changed. And so Steve went and bought him a Bible and, and gave it to him. And, and the next Sunday, man, Billy's at church. The family's at church. And, and Billy's like underlining verses. And the next Sunday, he's there. And the next Sunday, three Sundays in a row. The fourth Sunday, he's not there. The fifth Sunday, he's not there. Sixth Sunday, and, and, and Steve comes to me, he goes, Jeff, I don't know what happened to Billy. I, he was coming, and then I don't know what's going on. I said, well, call, call the family and see what's happening. So he called, and the mom answered the phone, and, and, and Steve goes, hey, I just want you to know I'm Billy's small group leader at church. And she goes, oh, yeah, he says such great things about you, and he loves church. And he goes, well, that's great, because he hasn't been here the last three weeks, and I just want you to know I've missed him. And, and she goes, yeah. She goes, you know what? Um, we got a dog. We, we, got, a new, we got a new puppy and so when we bought it, we, we got the puppy and, you know, the owner said, hey, you need to go to obedience school. So we went down and we signed up for obedience school, but they only offer it on Sundays. And it's three months. And, and so we went the first Sunday and, and we brought the puppy there. And so it's for, you know, three months to be there. And, and the guy at the place, he said this, he said, you know, it's so important that you and your whole family's there because the young puppy needs to learn his master's voice. It's so important in these early days that they learn their master's voice. <laughs> and Steve was like, yeah, it's really important. <laughs> in those early days, for a young believer to learn his master's voice. You know, you guys, God is speaking to us and he'll speak to our hearts if we'll just listen. And sometimes we get caught up and we go back to tradition, we go back to religion, and we think, man, I'll just check a box and kind of move on. And God's going, no, I'm inviting you to follow. I'm inviting you to trust. I'm inviting you to listen. There's a guy at our church who was just baptized recently. I want you to hear his story. Watch this. So I grew up in the church, um, and it was just kind of one of those, you know, every Sunday you go, you know, eat breakfast, and then you go home, and then you kind of don't think about it again until the next Sunday. You pray before bed, but it's just kind of a routine, like clockwork. Um, wasn't until about a year ago when I entered recovery, um, I'm an addict, that uh, I realized that God will help you. And, you know, growing up, I'd always pictured like God speaking to you in this big booming voice. And I realized in recovery that it's not that booming voice that he will speak to you in. He'll speak to you in little ways that you have to pay attention to. You know, now I just, I pray every day. I'm super duper thankful about what I have, what's been given to me. Um, you know, when things go wrong, I look at it as a learning experience and say like, you know, what are you trying to show me? What do I need to do better? Just the open-mindedness that I have and the listening that I do on a daily basis, just to try and learn more and to get more in touch with God. It just makes me so much happier now. So I got baptized when I was born, kind of like every child does. And like I said, I never really lived a life through Christ, um, especially in the past 
10 or so years. And so with this whole new transition and just now starting to live life through Christ, I figured, you know, I've been kind of reborn, I guess you could say, to a life like living Christ-like. And so I figured I would get baptized to kind of just solidify that, dedicating my life to Christ, being like, hey, I know what it feels like to not live through you. I don't want that. So I want to know exactly what it feels like to live every day through you. I want to be able to show people that, you know, regardless of your past, you can start over and you can make a change and that change can be permanent. I don't know, I just feel like it can make a ripple effect of people seeing, hey, if he did it, I can do it. Look where he is compared to how he used to be. If I just keep doing the next best thing in my life and become a living example of living through Christ, that I believe I can make a difference in people's lives. I mean, isn't that awesome? It's life change. That's what Jesus came to do for you and for me, for all of us. And God is drawing you to himself. He's inviting you into this relationship to follow, to trust, to believe. God has an incredible plan for you, purpose for you. Will you trust him? And maybe today God's speaking to you. Maybe today it's about salvation. <laughs> You've been trusting in religion. You've been trusting in tradition. You've been trusting if I'm good enough. No, it's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. And he loves you. And he paid the price for you. Maybe today God's speaking to you about being baptized and taking that next step in your spiritual journey and saying, yes, I want to put a stake in the ground. I want to go forward. Maybe God's calling you today just to say, listen to my voice. Spend time in my word and, and listen. We get caught up with the noise, but today God's just saying, hey, be still and know I am God. I got this. I got you. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are precious to me. And I love you. I want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. What do you believe about Jesus? <laughs> Is he enough for you today? <laughs> Can you hear his voice <laughs> saying, I love you? You are precious to me. Follow me. Trust me. Hold on to me. So Father God, here we are, your people, gathered in your name, and we've come to be with you. Jesus, meet us in this moment. <laughs> meet us in this moment, because you are the way. You are the way, and we trust you. After the service this morning, I'll be here. There'll be some of our A6 leaders, some of the spiritual leaders in our church. If you want to talk with somebody, you want to pray with somebody, that's what we're here for. But as we launch into this Easter season, 21 days, we'll celebrate Easter Sunday morning. Let's, let's be men and women who are passionate about Jesus. <laughs> let's be men and women who just fall more in love with Jesus, make a big deal about Jesus, because he is the reason for Easter. 
He's the reason for the hope that we have. He is the reason that we are alive. Maybe God's calling you to be baptized. And we're going to celebrate baptism on Easter Sunday morning. What a great day to be baptized. We have baptism information classes coming up for children, for students, for adults. You can see that in your worship guide. Maybe God's calling you to join the church and say, hey, I'm going to lock arms with other believers. But man, whatever God's calling you to, hear his voice. Trust him. Follow him. He is the way.